Thank you. Um, if this were a multi-track conference at this point, I would say, wow, I'm so excited at how many people are interested in learning more about running SQLite in production. Um, but I guess, given that you're here after lunch, you must be genuinely excited to learn more about SQLite in production. So uh, I appreciate it. So um, as Sveti said, my name is Steven. Uh, you can find me on Twitter at Fractaled Mind. Um, I'm an American expat that moved to Berlin, Germany five years ago. And about five weeks ago, I got married. <laughs> Thank you. It turned into a bit of an international adventure. Uh, we live in Germany. Uh, but getting a marriage license in Germany turned out to be functionally impossible for two non-citizens. So we ended up taking the train up north to Denmark. So I have a Danish marriage license. But we didn't have any friends or family with us in the Danish town hall. So we also planned a destination wedding in Jamaica and took photos in New York. So it was a fun couple of months. Um, as she said, for my day job, I am the head of engineering at Test.io, and in my free time, I am an open source contributor and maintainer. And along the way, work that I do, I, I write on my blog. So what I want to talk about today is why this is how I start all of my new Rails applications and have for the last couple of years. And specifically, I want to focus on why I choose SQLite as my database engine. And I want to suggest that for many of you, for many of your projects, it would actually make sense for you to try to use SQLite as well. And of course, any time I suggest this to a group of developers, the first question I get is, why? Why should I use SQLite? Isn't that just for toy apps? Isn't that just for running local tests quickly? And while I know for a fact that it certainly is not just for toy apps, I recognize that that is a fair question. And one of the things that I like to do as I talk to different groups of developers about this is to like take the opportunity to actually hear, like, what are some of the reasons that you aren't using SQLite in production? Like, just yell them out. It doesn't scale. It doesn't scale. It has light in the name. It has light in the name. <laughs> How do you do backups? Yeah? Yeah, you can't run on Heroku. Yeah, these are all really good points, and I'm going to cover a lot of them today. And if I don't cover yours, like, let's talk afterwards. Um, indeed, one of the most common responses that I get is that, like, I'm not using SQLite because it doesn't scale. And it doesn't scale because it only supports linear writes, right? So you can only have one write operation occurring in the entire database at a time. So of course, logically, this can't possibly scale. Um, and I want to address this point at the outset. And the specific thing that I want us to think about is how many linear write operations can SQLite perform in the same amount of time that we can perform one Postgres write operation. And luckily for me, I didn't even need to do the benchmarking. Ben Johnson, the creator of Lightstream, which we will come back to, um, did this exact benchmarking for a conference talk that he gave at GopherCon in 2021. And he compared running a single SQLite operation to run it write operation to running a single Postgres write operation in three different configurations. And what you see is that even when you're running Postgres on the same machine as your application, right, you can run 10 SQLite write operations in the same amount of time that you run one Postgres, right? Like the overhead of serializing and deserializing across that process um, is still noticeable. But of course, it's not common for most of us to build our applications today and self-host and self-manage Postgres ourselves. The most common situation is that you're going to be running a cloud-hosted, managed Postgres service. And in those contexts, it's quite likely that your application is going to be in a different cloud region than your Postgres. And of course, if you have a multi-region deployment, definitionally, some of those application instances are not in the same region. And even if you're in a neighboring region, so here the benchmark is looking at the latency from US East 1 to 2, 
you'll see that you can run over 600 SQLite writes in the same amount of time that you have to make one Postgres query. Right? So absolutely, SQLite does scale right, to a point. I'm not here to say that it's um, magic and you could build the next GitHub, but many of us don't need to build the next GitHub. So why do I think that it's worth taking this time to suggest that we use SQLite? Well, I imagine that many of you, like me, have seen the growing number of news stories of people waking up to astronomical cloud bills. And while SQLite is free, and that's amazing, it's also incredibly predictable what it's going to cost, right? Because it's just the cost of storage. And you can very easily see what is the size of my database, what is the usage pattern, like how much is this going to cost, and vertical scaling um, is very straightforward. You sort of immediately avoid that problem. Of course, in general, when it comes to cost, these cloud-managed database providers are dropping their free tiers left and right. Um, it's harder and harder to bootstrap an application and not have to pay for the database. And, and in fact, one of the few remaining generous free tiers in cloud-managed databases is Terso, which is cloud-managed SQLite. And they've written extensively on why the unique nature of SQLite allows them to have such a generous free tier. Um, and more and more people across the web development ecosystem are starting to explore the possibilities of using SQLite as a foundational part of the web application stack. And as more and more people explore that possibility, we are seeing more and more examples of people who are able to achieve meaningful scale for real business valuable use cases um, with just a single VPS and SQLite behind their application, uh, whether they're writing JavaScript applications or Go applications or Ruby applications or Python applications or what have you. Um, in the Rails community, though, specifically, I think that SQLite aligns really beautifully with the vision of Rails as the one-person framework. This was something that DHH reiterated and Rado was talking about just before lunch, right? And this union, I think, makes Rails a unique ecosystem to really take advantage of the full power and flexibility of SQLite. As for me, like the primary reasons that I choose SQLite are that, well, firstly, it is simple, right? It's literally, actually, truly a single file on disk. And the database engine is really just a single executable that runs inside of your process. Um, and that is a mental model that I can fully understand and fully debug. To go back to like Rado's slide about like boring tools and being able to know how something is going to fail and the kind of safety and security and speed and debugging that that gives you. Right? Simple tools allow for uh, a lot of control. Right? This kind of simplicity provides a unique degree of control. When your database is actually just a file on disk, it becomes possible to create a backup, SCP that backup to your local machine, and dig into production data anomalies in a full featured but still fully sandboxed environment. That's quite nice. You also, when you have a single executable, the tooling in Ruby with Bundler allows you to actually fully control all of the compilation flags of SQLite through Bundler directly, right? So you can have special compilation instances of SQLite for your application without any additional tooling. And the general simplicity of SQLite opens up some unique developer experience opportunities that we'll talk about more at the end. And then, of course, I mean, it goes without saying, but it is worth saying, it is fast. It's hard to really appreciate until you just play with it and experience like how nice it is to work with data that is right there, right next to your application. Same machine, same process. And I think so many of us have grown accustomed to having to deal with the latency of network requests. And you don't have to. 
And when you experience what it is like to not have to, it can be a bit addictive, and I do speak from experience. So that is why I think you should consider SQLite. But I am curious how many of us in the room, as of right now, have run or are running some kind of web application using SQLite in production, show of hands. Yeah, a couple, but not many. So I want to make sure that more of us feel comfortable and confident to actually run SQLite in production. So I want to turn from the more sort of theoretical to the pragmatic. And let's talk about how we can build, deploy, and maintain a SQLite on Rails application. And unfortunately, I have to start with some bad news. Today, it is not viable to take an application, Rails new, put it up on a server, and walk away. You are going to experience pain. It is not production ready. And personally, it's one of my goals to make that true for Rails 8, that the Rails new out of the box experience is production ready. But as of today, Rails 7.1, even the main branch of Rails, that isn't true, right? So we're going to have to do some tweaking. We're going to have to do some fine tuning. But I hope over the course of the next few minutes to show you that it's not too complicated. It's not scary. And what it gives you at the end is something that really is production grade, high developer experience software. So what does it take? What does it take? Well, luckily, it's actually not much. Here's the slide. You want to run SQLite in production. Take a picture of this slide. I've got QR codes. These are the repositories. These are blog posts talking more about these tools. Um, this is the sum total of the requirements to have a production-ready SQLite on Rails application. So thank you. I really appreciated your time. <laughs> OK. That is. Um, you know, one of these days, I want to do a version of this talk, and I will just stop there. But I recognize that probably a large number of you aren't yet fully convinced, and you're not really comfortable to say, yeah, OK, I'll just go home and I'll spin this up. So I recognize, let's, let's take a little bit more time and dig into some of the details, like what are these gems doing? Why are they doing them? And what else is worth talking about? So. I'm going to put it back. Anybody who hasn't taken a picture, this is the takeaway slide. If you fall asleep because of your heavy lunch, I understand it. Not a problem. Take a picture now. Go and check these things out. I'll see you in 15 minutes. For everyone else, let's go and walk through the key details. So I want to start with performance. How do you make your application performant? Right? How do we take advantage of the speed of SQLite? So there are four must-haves and one nice-to-have. And I don't have the opportunity to go in-depth on these, but I did have that opportunity in Wroclaw uh, about two weeks ago. And for anyone who might have been at that presentation, you would have enjoyed about an hour-long deep dive into these details. For everyone else, I extracted all of that into a blog post with all of the slides, and I was honored and humbled to hear Javier say that it was excellent content. So if it's good enough for Javier, it's good enough for you. Check it out. All of the details are there. But at a high level, what you need to ensure is that you're using write ahead logging mode. As of Rails 7.1, that is the default. You don't have to do anything for that. The next three are what the enhanced adapter are going to give you. Immediate transactions, a timeout mechanism that isn't blocking Ruby's global VM lock a fair retry interval. And then this is just a nice to have, and this is an experimental feature I've been working on, to actually isolate the connection pool so that write operations don't saturate your connection pool and block read operations at the level of like the connection pool. Um, unfortunately, I just don't have the time to go deep into them. There is a lot of depth. I explain all of the problems and all of the solutions in this blog post. And if you want to talk more about it, come and talk to me later. Luckily, it's simple, though, to get all of these things. The gem, the enhanced adapter, automatically injects the configuration into your Rails application. It's literally bundle add, and you're done. If you want to 
experiment with isolated connection pools. That is an opt-in configuration. So just throw this in your application RB and you'll get that. Um, and that will give you the full extent of performance as I know how to do it with those two lines of code. So performance, done, not too bad. Let's turn, though, to resilience. It's not just enough to have an application that runs quickly. You need to make sure that you have your data backed up. And I say this as someone who, yeah, deleted their production SQLite database before. Um, and for about two weeks, I was like, I really need to add backups. I really need to add backups. I'm sure I'll get to it. Accidentally delete production. And that was a unfortunate day. Um, so this is something that you really should do on day one, which is why I have really tried to invest some time into making it as simple and easy as possible. There are a number of tools, but I very much think that the best tool for the job is Lightstream. So Ben Johnson, the creator of Lightstream, um, whose benchmarks we saw earlier, um, is one of the experts on SQLite. Um, and if you're interested in this topic, he's really worth following and reading his content. It is a single Go executable that streams your changes to your database to an S3 compatible bucket storage service. And then you can use the, the CLI to restore a backup onto any machine as well. Since it is just a single Go executable, I actually just wrapped it up in a Ruby gem, uh, just like the SQLite 3 Ruby gem, right? So you can use bundle add Lightstream. It will compile it for the platform that you're on. Uh, and get everything spun up. And then in order to actually use it, there is an installation command. So the first one, you only needed one command. This one, you need two. But still, three I don't think is too bad. Um, you know, As always, QR codes for more information. Let's talk a little bit about what the installer does. It's going to create two files. The first file is the configuration file for the Lightstream utility itself. So it uses YAML configuration. And what the installer is going to do is it's going to introspect your database YAML, find all of the SQLite databases in your production environment, and write a Lightstream configuration that says, I want to back up all of these. So if you've got a database for active record and a database for solid queue and a database for solid cache, you know, we'll back up all of them. And it uses these environment variables um, to keep your Secrets, secret. So in order to wire this all together, it'll also create this initializer file. And this will allow you to configure those details in Ruby. And the sort of default example, you can do whatever you want. But the default example would be to just pull them out of credentials. So the template file that is spit out for you uses this structure. But wherever you want to store this information and bind it in, you can do it in the initializer. So with those two files, you have everything you need to get Lightstream up and running, but you do have to turn it on and get it running. So to do that, the gem provides you with a rake task. The rake tasks map directly to all of the CLI commands uh, when you read Lightstream's documentation. So Lightstream replicate. And the reason why we have a rake task is to bind together the Ruby configuration with the YAML configuration and get everything um, up and running. This is going to run as a separate process. So by default, the gem expects you'll add this to your proc file. And if you're not using a proc file, however it is that you're managing multiple processes, just throw this command in there and get this process running. Of course, replicating your database is nice, but the other half is equally as important. How do I restore a database? Another simple rake task um, where you pass in the database. Uh, and this is just going to be the path that matches something in your configuration before. Again, if you have multiple of them, you do that. And you can run this on the same machine where you're replicating. You can run it from another machine. You can run it from your local laptop. It's an easy way to pull that data down safely without having to do that backup in SCP. You can get production data down uh, really easily through this. But as I was working on this talk, actually, I was thinking some like, is this sufficient? Right? Would I want something more? And I, th I would, something, would, would want something more, and I think that we deserve something more, because it's not just enough to have a way to restore. I want to make sure that my backups are 
working, right? That I can restore them. I want a way to verify that my backup system is working, that I have up-to-date backups, that I can restore, and what I restore has the data that I need and it's up-to-date. So I added a new rake task, and this is not one of the Lightstream commands. This is just in the gem. So Lightstream verify, you pass it to the database. And what it's going to do is it's going to run that restore command, grab the most recent backup that is available, and pull it down. And it's going to print out a few details. I started with like the bare minimum. If you've got good ideas on other stuff to add, come and talk with me. Open to PRs. But it's going to get the size in bytes of the original, what you have on your machine, the restored copy that just got pulled down, and it'll print out the delta. And it'll do the same for the number of tables. Um, I'm sure that there are additional things to add, and I'm working right now on adding a configuration hook so you can write your own Ruby code to define some custom specific logic to verify a backup as well. Um, so I'm sure there are ways to improve this, but this is a nice way to get this tied in to your process and maybe even create like a recurring solid queue job that runs this every day or every week and sends reports where you can sleep well at night knowing my backups are running and they are restorable. But I also don't think that that's necessarily enough, right? I want to be able to see quickly at any moment in my Rails app itself, like, are things running? Ideally, right, I want a little web dashboard. I'd like to see Lightstream. I want to see the process status. I want to see the PID. I want to see, from Lightstream's point of view, what are all the databases that it's backing up? What are, it calls, the generations and the snapshots? What are the details? So with together a really simple page here that just takes all of the information that Lightstream makes available, maps it onto a web page, and through that into a simple Rails engine, you can add Lightstream Rails, mount the routes, and now you have observability in a web dashboard. You can, of course, like secure this route however you want. But at this point, I think, OK, this is quite nice. I've got backups. I can restore from those backups. I can verify my backups. And I can pull, up, pull open a web page at any point and see the status of everything that Lightstream knows about the universe at that point in time. So resilience, done. What else? Enhancements. There are a lot of different ways that we can enhance the experience of using SQLite with Rails. And the enhanced adapter gem, as the name might suggest, includes many of them. So beyond all of the performance improvements that we've already talked about, it also brings a number of SQL features into the active record adapter, some of which are in Rails 7.1, some of which are in the main branch, and some of which are not yet in the main branch. And then it also brings some additional power to your database YAML configuration file. So just to walk through those quickly, you can get deferred foreign keys. This is something that is available for the Postgres and MySQL adapters. SQLite supports the SQL syntax. The Active Record adapter supports it as well. But the SQLite Active Record adapter doesn't. We turn that on. Pull request details are here. Um, one of my favorites, virtual columns, SQLite fully supports it. It supports both stored and unstored virtual columns. Um, this feature is in Rails main, but not in a point release yet. Um, and for those of us who have used this in Postgres, I think you would agree it's a very nice feature. Um, and I can't wait till this actually makes it into a point release. We also have the ability to specify custom returning values. And this also is the feature that drives auto-hydrating those virtual columns. So for those of you who have used it, if you ever like run post.create and you have a virtual column definition in there, when you get that object back, the active record object, it'll have that, that value. And the way that Rails does that is through specifying in the actual SQL syntax which columns it wants returned. Uh, and it gives you control of that when you're using insert or insert all as well. And that's a really nice feature. And as I said, it also gives you enhancements to your database YAML. So the one thing it does is it allows you to specify any of SQLite's configuration pragmas 
directly in your database YAML. Um, it's also going to allow you to specify any extensions that you want to load. There are a number of extensions that are available as Ruby gems. You can just bundle add them, but you have to wire them up to your SQLite instance. And the enhanced adapter gem just provides an extensions array, and you can list them out there. Very straightforward. Um, in addition to those enhancements from the gem, the Rails world is seeing a general trend towards moving more and more of the persistent data needs of our applications onto the database, or at least making it possible. Right? So we have solid cache and solid queue. Solid cable is being worked on, will be worked on, whatever the status is. But these uh, fit really nicely with SQLite. And even in applications that you have that are using Postgres to back active record, it might make sense to throw solid cache into your gem and back that cache with a SQLite database. Right? Or it might make sense to still use solid queue and back that with a separate SQLite database instead of, any, instead of having managed Redis um, and all of the drama with Redis and its alternatives. Right? So it, you can mix and match. This is not like an all or nothing situation. There are many use cases that uh, make sense for SQLite. I personally have gone all in because I'm cheap and I like to master a small number of tools. But it's not a requirement, right? Um, and it is quite nice if you do go all in that these things all play well together. So all of the configuration changes for the connection adapters, right? That's true for all of the connections. All of these gems use active record to tie together the, the database. So you're going to get the speed improvements. You're going to get the performance improvements, the concurrency improvements, whether you're using active record or solid cache or solid queue. The backups, right? We're going to introspect your database YAML and back up all of the databases. So if you have a cache database and a queue database and a production database, all three of those are going to be backed up. You can restore all of them. You can verify all of them, right? So the goal here is to have a very very cohesive ecosystem where all of the benefits are true of all of the different databases, regardless of how you mix and match. As I said, you can also fully control the compilation of SQLite. And um, this is like a subset of SQLite's own recommendations for applications. As like a small note, one thing that's true about SQLite, and it's worth like iterating this so that reiterating this so we all uh, remember it. The SQLite team cares way more about backwards compatibility than they do about having hot, sexy features. So they have built a lot of really powerful and amazing tools and made the database truly viable for production web applications in the last two decades. But none of those features are turned on by default because it's far more important for them that you can run the SQLite three CLI command and open a database created 30 years ago than it is that you spin it up today and you get all the new defaults. So there, it is beneficial. They say that this you know, might give you a 5% performance increase, this, these set of compilation changes. So you know, take it or leave it, how much complexity you want to add to it. But in general, to recognize that's why we have to configure all of these things. SQLite doesn't push everything forward on a new version and say, well, now if you're running SQLite 3.15, you can't open a file created in SQLite 3.14. And while it can be a bit annoying um, at this moment when I'm trying to sell you on the possibility of considering it, once you are using it, it's actually very nice. That kind of resiliency, going back to boring tools, that kind of resiliency, that kind of backwards compatibility, right? it is a guarantee made by the maintainer team that you can upgrade. You can always upgrade. It's never going to cause you a problem. And of course, their maniacal approach to testing is also pretty well known at this point, which is helps, which is a key part of like verifying that. Anyway, this is what it looks like. You can read more in the documentation uh, of the gem, the SQLite 3 gem as well. I have a blog post on why these compilation settings, what they do. Um, one of the other enhancements that I personally quite like that SQLite makes quite easy is branch-specific databases. How many of us have been working on a long-running feature branch, and one of our colleagues comes to us and says, hey, I really need you to review this feature branch that I've got going. 
And of course, we've got two migrations in our feature branch. So they had one migration in their feature branch. We switch over. Ah, now our database is in this weird, inconsistent state. We try to switch back. It's a mess. So much nicer to just have completely isolated databases for every Git branch. And I was genuinely amazed at how easy it was to set up, right? Your database YAML file is going to get piped through ERB. You just write that in. Of course, in ERB, we can just throw some Git commands in there. So we can just make dynamically the name of our database, the name of our current branch. And then in order to make sure that that database has been migrated and seeded and is ready to go, well, they provide programmatic access to their rake tasks. So we can just call the prepare task, throw that in an after initialize hook in our development environment. Boom. <laughs> it's, it's really been amazing to work with, especially as more and more people in the team are working on these applications that we have at work. And it's fundamentally a two-line change. And I'm sure that there are many, many more of these. Like As more people start to explore this space, I'm sure we can find all kinds of interesting creative opportunities that come from how light, pun intended, and simple SQLite is in our applications. So enhancements, there we go. One final point, just to talk a little bit about deployment. Of course, it's worth making very clear, as we heard from the back, you can't run a SQLite application on Heroku. They're ephemeral storage. It's ephemeral. <laughs> so you, you put your database there, you're going to feel a lot of pain in somewhere between 10 to 24 hours. So don't do it. Um, as for alternatives, of course, there are the sort of newer services trying to take up the mantle of Heroku, Render, Fly.io. Um, personally, myself, I use Hatchbox. I find it to be incredibly easy, incredibly powerful. Um, I've got a whole post walking through literally every single screen and every single step on how you would use Hatchbox to deploy a SQLite on Rails application, um, if you want to check that out. And of course, as we heard yesterday, we have the new Kamal tool um, that Joseph was telling us about. Um, I personally haven't used it, and that is because I have found that my SQLite on Rails applications, uh, I have cross-platform reproducible builds simply through Bundler and RubyGems, and I don't need Docker because I don't have any additional dependencies at the infrastructure layer aside from Ruby and SQLite. And that's amazing, and I really enjoy that. But for those of us who are already in the Docker world, you can find many posts on how to deploy SQLite Rails applications through Kamal as well. But that's really all I have to say on deployments. So we've covered performance, resilience, enhancements, deployment. As far as I know, those are the four key pillars of running an application. Um, if there are things that I missed, please come and talk to me, let me know. I'd love to have a sense of that and make this talk even longer for the next time. But I hope at the end of this, for those of us who were able to make it through, that we have a sense of the reasons why uh, DHH might actually put a slide like this up. Right? For the use cases where it makes sense, of which there are many, if you don't need truly planet scale deployments, if you don't have users who are as active and as many of them in both central, uh, the central part of the US and Japan. Right? If you only need 500 requests per second, yeah, SQLite on Rails is going to serve you very well. And it's going to be cheaper. It's going to be easier to build. It's going to be easier to maintain. It's going to be easier to deploy. And as things stand, while it isn't viable to just go Rails new and put it on the internet. It really can be as simple as three CLI commands and then as many additional bits of fanciness as you want. And you can have a full, feature-rich, economically valuable application running on a $5, $10, $15 a month VPS and drive the kind of business that Rado was talking about. Um, and of course, if not, that's fine too. Don't tell me about it, but you do you, right? I'm just here to let you know what's possible. At this point, genuinely, I am done. Thank you very much for your attention. And <laughs>